Way back in the 1990s, Kevin Wakeford, who was then running a business organization, raised the alarm about the sudden and rapid deterioration of the RAND. We'd seen the RAND fall, we didn't know why. He then became the instigator behind the 2002 RAND Commission into the rapid deterioration of the local currency. The RAND had collapsed from 1760, 1750, 1760 to about 1384 by late 2001. It was an absolute calamity. In the last year or so, we have seen very similar currency moves. Could there be a parallel to be drawn? There's a lot we don't know about the current allegations about currency manipulation. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, the chief executive of the former chief executive of the South African Chamber of Business, the 2001 whistleblower, Kevin Wakeford, to talk about the case. He referred to the Tribunal for Prosecution. Uh, of course, the 17 local and international banks allegedly colluding to fix the price of the rand. Kevin Wakeford, when you cast your mind back near nearly two decades now to when the currency was last being manipulated. Do you see any parallels? Uh, Bruce, you know, if, if one examines the situation, this, this is a competition commission matter. It's more around anti-competitive behavior and, and breaking the rules in that context. Uh, certainly the 2001 crash, in my view anyway, in the view of, of, of many, many publishers, speaks to the, the, the externalization of capital um, and, and using that to front run and to make plenty of money, but having a huge impact uh, on the value of the currency. In this case, of course, it involves um, uh, what they call price fixing, um, fictitious price setting, quoting of fictitious prices, um, 17 banks involved, probably 30% 30, 30 of total trade in rands internationally. So it's, it's not identical. It's certainly um, something that speaks to skullduggery and it does speak to manipulation because when you start price fixing and quoting fictitious prices, uh, then of course, it, it definitely would have an impact uh, on, on the currency itself. Now, okay, so there are no direct parallels to be drawn between what you blew the whistle on, which was large corporates externalizing money. There was the whole RAND Commission, which launched an inquiry into it. And from that, one would have thought we would have learned a lot of lessons. And amongst those lessons, one would have thought we would have thought oversight of trading rooms is probably not a bad idea. There seems best case scenario to have been a very significant lack of oversight of trading rooms in this particular case. Absolutely, Bruce. Um, you know, the, the guys were were colluding um, and it was, you know, it was across oceans. It wasn't just in South Africa itself because the RAND is a fairly highly traded currency internationally for a, for a small nation state as ours. And, you know, so it's stretched into the North Americas at, as far as New Zealand, where, where, where certain chat rooms were being used in order to fix uh, or to quote fictitious prices. And that, that speaks to a clear lack of oversight, uh, compliance, no proper corporate governance. I think Mervyn King and the King Code would have a field day if they, if they were to look into what controls were put in place and what level of transparency and accountability was in place uh, within those institutions. I mean, you came head to head with the arrogance of corporate South Africa back in 2001 when you blew the whistle. It, it cost you a very powerful and, and promising career as the chief executive at the time of SACOB. Uh, that level of arrogance seems to be being replicated 15 years later. You know, it, there seems to be some ratting. So uh, there's talk of, of two financial institutions which have tried to cut a deal, uh, the most recent being Citibank, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and of course agreeing to pay a fine as well uh, in, in the interim. So, you know, the, I, I, my suspicion on this one, Bruce, is that uh, there's sufficient evidence to, to dilute the level of arrogance. But, you know, if one speaks about, well, we'll settle, we'll pay the fines, and we'll walk away and we won't really change how we do things, I suspect that is arrogance. And we've seen banks 
uh, with the LIBOR scandal, uh, with the post-2008 crisis, where there's been significant fines that have been paid. There have been some sacrificial lambs as, as individuals. But generally speaking, th those institutions have used shareholder capital. Uh, they've used some of their operating profits to pay the, the, those huge fines. But has it really done anything to change corporate governance or corporate behavior? My suspicion is that it hasn't. And until one looks at this more comprehensively, until one has consequence management uh, in terms of some collaborative effort between countries, um, until people lose their currency trading licenses, perhaps, and even in the asset management arena, you know, if, if, the, if the institutions that govern this both globally and, and locally were to work together and were to actually uh, make it felt in terms of consequence management, if more people ended up behind bars, because this isn't just about the Competitions Act, because in, in a sense, the Competitions Act looks specifically to anti-competitive behavior. But if you are quoting a fictitious price, or if you're putting in false bids and offers, um, and if you're fixing prices, in a sense, that points to much, much more than anti-competitive behavior. It's actually fraud and theft yeah. as well. It most certainly know? is. And we want people in those trading rooms to go to jail for committing a crime. How far up the corporate ladder, though, do those consequences need to go? Does it need to go all the way to the top? The Competition Act uh, makes it possible for directors of companies uh, who knew about collusion, were part of collusion, to go to jail as well. I'm not sure what's going to happen in this particular case, but perhaps as HSBC did this week, it cut executive pay very dramatically because HSBC, like many other banks around the world, has found itself falling foul of regulators all over the world. If directors didn't know what was going on at the bank, they blim and well should have, or at least have put mechanisms in place to mitigate the risks. Bruce, if, if one examines the Companies Act, it becomes quite clear that, you know, if there is reckless trading, if there is negligence, if there's a lack of oversight, those, those are the fiduciary duties of directors, both non-executive and executive. That's why we have audit and risk committees. Uh, that's why we have a whole, you know, company sign off on all these huge corporate governance protocols. But somehow we don't live, we, we, we tend to tick the boxes, but we don't live those codes of conduct. And we don't really apply the law to the full in terms of how we operate companies, in particular when they become bigger than the, the GDP of, of nation states that they operate in, you know. So, so there's the, my view is chief executive officers, directors, both non-exec and exec, should be brought to book. Um, they should be brought before the Competition Commission. And if the Comp Commission feels they don't have sufficient teeth, then one perhaps needs uh, a Judicial Commission of Inquiry, which not only looks to these specific cases, but to the entire system within the financial services mm. sector, so that we can try and get a good set of recommendations out of that, that will ultimately le lead to clean corporate governance in South Africa, particularly in a sector that is so powerful, and yet they're managing our money at the end of the mm. day. If you look at the pension fund industry, if you look at the unit trust industry, there's a heck of a lot of ordinary people's investments and monies being managed by people who seemingly lack integrity. Now, and this is, uh, this is a crisis of confidence that, of course, banks in South Africa are always held up to be squeaky clean and way above the rest of the world. When 2008 happened, South Africa's corporate governance structures were heralded as amongst the best in the world, and we avoided the crisis of confidence that many of the global banks faced. One of the problems we face, of course, as regulators in South Africa, or our regulators face, is that they might be able to nail executives at Standard Bank, they might be able to nail executives at Investec, but there are 12, 13, 14 global banks who won't fall, uh, won't fall under their similar jurisdiction. And that makes prosecution by the South African authorities in a matter like this that much more difficult. 
spot on, spot on. Uh, the, these things are difficult, but they are relationships between different nation states. For instance, the South African Revenue Service has some excellent relationships with, with other countries uh, where, where they can pursue, prosecute, bring people back. Uh, we, we do have protocols between you know, foreign affairs as well as uh, other institutions within the state where we could potentially pursue. But if we can't, then we shouldn't allow those banks to, to, to at least from a currency trading mm. viewpoint, they shouldn't be allowed to trade within the South African jurisdiction or perhaps that local bank shouldn't be allowed to, to trade with other banks that refuse to subscribe themselves to our legal system. Now, the competition authorities require all the help they can get. As you know, currency trading, currency speculation is a massively complex web um, to, to unpack and to, to disentangle. So they've got Barclays, they've got APSA in who have prepared to be whistleblowers. We've got uh, Citibank, which has paid a nearly 70 million rand fine this week. It's agreed to turn effectively state's witness. Should we be allowing anybody else to turn state's witness? Or do we now say, right, we've got the guys who are on our side on this particular matter let's go to the wall on this one and prosecute it's hard for me to say i, I you know i'm not a, i have no linkages whatsoever mm. to the comp commission uh, it, it would really be determined whether they feel they have sufficient evidence to move forward uh, if they require perhaps more and they are digging in certain areas and they feel that perhaps another bank uh, if, if they were to come forward, they would have then sufficient. It's, it's you know, how long is a piece of string? I would, I would say that if they require more evidence, they should allow, you know, another bank to plea bargain and then to pursue the rest. But for, for me, this, this particular event is more about what remedies can we put in place? Yes, people must be prosecuted, banks must be prosecuted, but it's no good prosecuting and then having similar behavior, you know, in, in, you know, in October mm. this year, for instance. So it, it, it's got to have some level of positive outcome for, you know, for the reputational integrity of the banking system, of the financial services sector, and for the South African economy as a whole. Kevin Wakeford, thanks for chatting to us in 2001. He was the whistleblower. He was the guy running SACOB, the South African Chamber of Business at the time. He got evidence. He presented that evidence. There was a commission of inquiry into the RAND. And we saw the very sharp recovery in the RAND as that process unfolded. More of the story, no doubt, as the case unfolds. And many bankers possibly fold and collapse in a subturating heap. Until next time, though, thank you for watching. And thank you, Kevin Wakeford, once again. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.